right? Yeah. So older ewes need body condition, younger ewes need to be driven by weight. Ovulation can be stimulated by the rapid introduction of rams. That's the ram effect. I'll, I'll talk about that. High-quality mineral supplement will do it. A sudden appearance of green feed after dry periods will do it. So summer storms. This is uncontrolled, right? And the number of eggs shared is controlled by nutrition and environment. Okay, the environment are shorter days. So I wanted to lead into that concept of ovulation and the strengths of ovulation um, by talking about the RAM effect. The RAM effect occurs when non-cycling ewes are stimulated to ovulate uh, by the pheromones produced by RAMs or, or teasers. So teasers are testosterone-injected weathers or vasectomized rams. Now, vasectomized rams give a better result than testosterone-injected weathers. There is some work around that. Uh, using rams need to be isolated from sight, sound, and smell for more than 30 days, and it doesn't work in flocks where ewes are already cycling or when ewes have been in contact with male goats within the previous month, i.e., Shearing. Now, let me expand on that a little bit because here's an important thing to note. If sheep, if ewes have been in contact with rams very early on in the season and it's triggered a cycle, then there can be a refractive event occur in season. So what that means is if you induce a cycle, especially in new lambs, early in the season and you don't take advantage of it, i.e. they become pregnant, they can actually be affected with a point where they won't ovulate later in the season, okay? So that's important to understand because it's a question to ask if there's been a problem. When did you shear? Oh, you sh obviously, they were shorn at this date. Were there, did you keep the rams and the ewes separate? Separate means that they can't see, smell, or hear each other. Now, ram ratios... Uh, needs to be fairly high and out of season, 2 to 3%, because if you induce the cycle, you want to capture the cycle. And if you've increased the strength of ovulation and the ability to cycle with regulin, and then you do a, have a really good ram effect, when you introduce the rams, you want them to actually be able to like pick them up on the cycle, not run around. And it's maths. It's the length of estrus times the amount of ewes divided by the amount of rams. That's the equation, isn't it? So if ewes express for 24 hours, there's 100 ewes. There's 2,400 hours of <coughs> estrus available to the rams. <coughs> if an average ram can cover 20 ewes in a 24-hour period, what's the ram percentage required to do one cycle? 2,400 divided by 20 times... 12%. That's how it works. So they have two cycles at 6%. However, all ewes don't come into heat at the same time, do they? They don't all go, bang, I'm on heat. So there's a spread out, drop it by 50%. That's where you come up with 2 and 3%. It's just a maths equation. There's two ways you can guarantee ewes have actually had a ram pass over the top of them. One is by observation and the other is by marking. How many rams do farmers put harnesses on nowadays? Don't people just don't do it? It's it's really yeah. hard. You know, you do it in single sires or you do it in studs sometimes, even now. But the reality is it's not done. So the only way to compensate for the lack of the ability to observe, the lack of the ability to actually mark is ram percentage. But it's really important. So the RAM effect was discovered by Professor Graham Martin, who now resides at Murdoch University. Okay, this is his work. It's his slide that he argues that the RAM effect works from mid-October until the end of December. All the work was done in mature merinos. So... The ram effect is less reliable in new lambs. It's less reliable in crossbreds. It's less reliable in first cross, and it's an unknown in composites. So the ram effect works by ram introduction, rapid ram introduction. So ram introduction occurs here. So the cursor, ram introduction, luteinizing hormone goes all over the place. One day later, there's a big spike in LH. Progesterone builds up. 
17, 18 days longer, it drops away, spike in uh, LH again, and heat occurs. Heat occurs here. This is a really reliable first heat by the RAM effect. RAM introduction, the way the, the luteinizing hormone is produced suddenly changes. It rumbles away, up and down, up and down, and then a day later there's a great big spike, and that triggers a progesterone event. Progesterone builds up, builds up, builds up, goes through a cycle, drops away, big peak, heat occurs. So if this was an AI event, this is the cedar in and this is the cedar out, okay? Now, a short cycle is where there is an ovulation without heat. So the corpus luteum quality is poor and it doesn't rupture. So day one here, we get a spike, but progesterone, because there's no clear... Uh, indicator of heat. Progesterone doesn't build up for another seven days. There's another spike. Ovulation without heat occurs, so a spike. And then progesterone builds up. It drops away. Big spike in LH and <laughs> heat occurs here at day 25 here. So you see what happens is you get this extension. So this period here, when they talk about short cycle, is that period from here to here is significantly shorter. It's seven days shorter. So you, in essence, get a weaker ovulation on the first short cycle, and it's delayed a week. So rams are responsible for 50% of the, the um, reproductive performance in a flock. Yet, does anyone think rams are given 50% of the attention that are due to them or to basically we just ignore rams for a year and about 12 weeks if they're lucky before joining we pay attention to them most of the time it's eight weeks before joining we start looking at them yet they have the ability to affect performance more than anything else and there are plenty of places where they are still using one percent now one percent is still a challenge in season it is normally a disaster out of season because the ram just can't get around to the use fast enough. I'll give you a classic example of not enough rams. Yep. It's called the 12% syndrome. So, Justin, do you get guys that year in, year out get 10 and 12% dry use? Yeah, all the time. What's their ram percentage? Oh, well, I don't ask everybody, but quite often it'd probably be lower. And I'm not saying that you can't do it. I'm just saying, except the fact that, oh, yeah, those ewes joined up all right the second time. That's because the ram didn't get to them. The old adage with merinos was 1% plus 1. Is, yep. that a, is that something you're familiar with? Is that a... Yeah, yeah. Tell me where that comes from. Do you want to know where it comes yeah, from? Yeah. It comes from a trial done at Hay in 1943, rams trapping ewes on water on stations. That's where it comes from. That's how old the data is, wow. right? That's why they say, you know, it's 1% plus 1 plus another 1 for every obstacle in the way. So if there's a river in the way, you need another one. If there's a boulder in the way, you need another one. You all heard that? It come 1943, a trial in 1943, rams trapping ewes on water in the hay, on the hay plains. You know, merinos, if you're joining merinos in March, this is, they're ovulating at the drop of the hat. They, they don't need the ram there to ovulate. They are already They are already ovulating, as I said, without a ram being present. So they're just there ready, and a ram jumps like a, you know, the only challenge you've got with rams is that, you know, the average work cycle of a ram is much lower than people think. You've just got to be aware that lots of times, if you've got a consistently high dry percentage, but your sheep are managed well, you need to look at the ram percentage because they're just not getting around. You know, March, April, May, merinos at 1% plus 1 for 8 to 12 weeks, it's more than enough. It's just not enough in October, you know, when you join them for five or six weeks. These guys that talk on Twitter and podcasts and Facebook about having, you know, 15 and 17-day joinings, what they don't say is that they rejoin. They scan and rejoin. They scan and rejoin. They scan and rejoin. They might, re they might have four joinings. 
there's a guy who has got very seasonal sheep who says he joins them in December. Now, what he actually means is he puts the rams in in December and then he scans them, you know, like takes them out, uh, puts them in for six weeks, takes them out for five weeks, puts them in for six weeks, takes them out for five weeks, puts them in for six weeks. That's not a December joining. That's a four-month joining. What you really want to know is how many sheep became pregnant from the December joining, how many sheep became pregnant from the January joining and the February and the March joining. That's actually what you want to know, yeah? You can't actually treat rams for anything, foot rot, fly. A coitus is just damage or inflammation of the reproductive tract. Um, you have to prevent it. The reason that you can't treat it is because the moment you elevate the temperature of a ram, it has an impact yeah. on the semen yeah. values and it takes six to eight weeks to produce sperm, okay? Ram behaviour is really important, whether it's dominant behaviour, male orientation or poor performance. <clears throat> All of those can have a negative effect. Eight weeks of um, sperm production cycle. And this is the classic, <clears throat> is do you know the fertility and performance of the behaviour of rams? Because most people know the behaviour of their ewes, don't they? Do you know how they know the performance and behaviour of their ewes? They scan um... them. But they really don't know which is their highest or lowest performing ram. You know, and do they create a good ram effect? That's the other question. You know, yeah. you know guys, when you're checking testicles, basically they should be the size, shape, and consistency of a can of beer. When you squeeze yeah. it, it should feel like a can of beer. Mm. And if you check them and you feel oh, yeah. something that's odd, well, it's, it's odd, isn't it? Get it checked. People will say, oh, I don't know what I'm looking for or anything. Well, yeah, you do. If it if it's something look doesn't feel normal, well, guess what? It's not normal. So half the vets I see in the field now wouldn't know how to actually check a ram properly anyway. I don't reckon. So if you look at this slide, if you look carefully at that image, you'll notice that that is the best looking you and the best looking ram I could find on the internet. Perhaps not. This is an example of behaviour. So on the left-hand side, that uh, E13 through to E24, those 10 odd ewes there, uh, they're ewes, and across the top are the rams. And it's looking at the amount of jumps and the amount of covers, right? So if you have a look at ram 12, he's jumped 16 times and he's jumped you 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 21, 22, and 24. So it's covered the bulk of the U's, right? When you look here at this uh, Ram 13, it's done 10 jumps, but it's jumped one U six times and one U twice. Whereas this ram's had eight jumps, but it's covered one, two, three, four, five, six ewes. Um, and that's that's actually a real problem. This you this ram here had jumped eight times, but jumped one u five times. Okay, u thirteen. And this u twenty two, she was very selective, would only allow one ram to jump her. Okay. Or so she what was she What's ugly it? ugly, and no one wanted to jump it? Was it the well, other one? The Rams Yeah, well, work. you know, what's the equaliser in the human world is beer and champagne, you know? So there's no beer and there's no champagne in a in a sheep paddock, so yeah. ewes and rams don't get any better looking, do they? Right. They stay the same. So ewes and rams are selective. What is the only way that you can practically overcome this issue. Multiple rams. Multiple, yeah, multiple rams, that's right. Yeah. Ram percentage. Like this this ram here at 12 jumps jumped one U eight times. You know? This ram jumps at U eight times. This ram jumps at U six times. You know, like there is no compensatory fact except for ram percentage. So... 
if melatonin triggers the natural hormonal sequence in ewes, what does it do in um, in rams? Regulin increases the amount of sperm per ejaculate. We can't actually make a claim that it increases libido even though it does. So this, this slide that you're looking at now, this is actually from the Australian research that we did with um, 25 Merinos and 25 Border Lesters. We implanted them in early September and we checked their semen all the way through to the end of March from memory. So if you have had a look at the baseline, the baseline is the control merino and the control PDs. Okay, you can see that the melatonin available in their um, seminal plasma stayed low and consistent. There was a bump in the control PDs um, mid non-breeding season. We don't really, I don't think we really understand that. Um, but it was statistically um, minor. And you're talking about pectograms, pectograms per milliliter, okay, which is a, is it a millionth or a billionth? I think it's a millionth of a gram, okay, pecto. So if you have a look at the pole dorsets, you'll notice that when we implanted them, um, 30 days later, you can see that they were really on a climb um, and then at sort of that was 30 day 60, day 90, 120 days. Yeah, that's roughly right. Um, and you can see it starts to decline at point, the second point of measurement. Uh, then it drops back late in the breeding season and in the breeding season it's consistent with baseline, Okay. Uh, in the merinos, it was slower to pick up. This is melatonin. Um, it held flatter, but it stayed on a, a downward trajectory for longer. In the border lesters, so in the border lesters in the Sardi work, this is all published work, by the way, you'll notice that the libido in the rams was significant. This is young border lesters. Okay, they were less than a year old, so it would have been their first uh, we bought them and it was if, as if it was their first use of joining. So um, if you have a look at, you know, sort of mid-November, um, you know, nearly 60% of the rams would jump compared to the unimplanted would, wouldn't jump at all. That stayed high in early December, late December, January, February. In fact, it stayed higher than the implanted rams all the way through the early part of joining season and the late part of the joining season. So this was a really big deal, all right? So in young, inexperienced border lesters, the difference was <coughs> really high. Uh, the impact on testosterone, so regulin, melatonin, has a direct impact on testosterone in rams. Testosterone drives libido. Libido. So if you have a look at study the study weeks um, in melatonin, you see that big peak at week six that corresponded with a peak, a B peak in week six of testosterone. And then it, it peaked again at week 30, which is well into the breeding season. Now, if you notice that this testosterone dropped at week 12 and dropped at week 12, back to relatively normal for that week and then went back up again. Okay, we wanted to see if there was a refractory behaviour in rams. Was did there is there a negative response in the following breeding season when you implant regular in rams for the non-breeding season? And the answer is no, there's no refraction. There's no real difference between... Um, not implanted in, t in testosterone once you get past week 12. What we did see was testosterone stayed high all the way through. The reason it dropped off in week 12 is because we actually didn't test it. And um, if we had it tested in week 12, you would have seen that that baseline would have just stayed elevated. The fact that there's a dip in it 
this dip here was the fact that we didn't test. We just retested here. So when we look at the increase in scrotal circumference, that stayed fairly consistent um, all the way through to week 30. There was an advantage in scrotal circumference for the implanted treatment group all the way through for 30 weeks, basically. And what does that mean? Testicle size is an indicator of spermatic production. All right, this is why there's a breed society size in Pole Dorset, in White Suffolk, in Border Leicesters, in Dorpers, etc. What we saw in the sperm in in um, sperm production, so this is the amount of sperm per ejaculate, right from within seven days, early in the breeding season, mid breeding season, late non breeding season, there was an increase in the amount of sperm per ejaculate compared to the baseline. And even into the breeding season, that remained higher. The key points are while rams will jump at any time, and anyone who says they won't, they will given the right circumstances, but they do suffer from seasonal and estrous behaviour. They reduce their libido and spermatic capacity is significantly reduced. Um, we know through experience and studies Three implants improves the reproduction performance in an estrus season. If you put three in instead of two, you cover nearly all the weight ranges of rams from small light rams through to big ram. So three is to go. Increases the quality and quantity of sperm in rams and scrotal circumference. Okay. Uh, increases libido and they're more active. Uh, performance of rams, increased fertility um, and siring. Uh, it's effective for about 100 to 120 days. If you've got two really close joinings, so let's say you've got uh, an October, mid-October, followed by, let's say, a mid-November joining, my suggestion is if you're using the rams in both, I would implant 50% to be targeted for October and 50% to be targeted for November. You'll get an increased benefit from both but you'll get a bit longer cover for the for the November. So in in that case, my suggestion is that you talk to me. Okay. <laughs>